We're so thankful for your leadership and how you serve around here, and especially coming out of this last year. There is just no possible way that we could have uh, done what uh, we've been able to do without you guys. So I, I hope tonight at the end of this time and that you feel like it was well worth your time, and I hope you feel loved. I hope you feel encouraged because certainly the Lord has worked through each and every one of you in a big way. So I want to start off tonight with just celebrating a little bit of of what's occurred last year. Obviously, last year was an unprecedented year in, in so many ways, but I want to celebrate a few things. One of the things that I want to do, if you'll help me, Andy and Shirley Riddle. Andy has served as our chairman of deacons, and Andy hung over. Hung over that didn't sound good. He was Yeah. He wasn't hung over. Andy stayed over uh, for another year. Uh, he was going to rotate off, but we were coming back in after COVID, re-entry, and it was just a kind of a mess, and he's such a great leader, so Andy and Shirley served an extra year, so thank you guys so much for your faithful ministry. Where are you guys? Andy and Shirley, where are you? I know you're here somewhere tonight. I can't see you. There you are. Thank you guys. I appreciate that. It's a great, great picture of their family, Peyton and Kellyanne in that picture as well. You know, maybe the number one question I got when we were in the middle of, of, of COVID, and obviously things have you know, we're still not completely out of the woods uh, yet, but our financial questions, how is the church doing? I think we're going on 19 months without taking an offering. We just finished last budget year. It, it closed up at the, the end of June. Uh, going into last year's budget, uh, our finance team uh, cut the budget a little bit because of COVID and, and just anticipating uh, kind of a downturn uh, in the economy. So cut the budget down to just a little over $8 million dollars. Uh, last year, we received over $10 million uh, during a COVID year. So just thank you for your faithful giving, and just, man, it's amazing to see what God God did. And so because of that, uh, because one of the things we try to do is live practically around here. Now, that's one of our values, so we've been able to save some money. And in this last year, we've been able to upgrade some facilities, so we want to celebrate that just a little bit uh, tonight. Buchanan, our Buchanan campus is here tonight. I've seen a bunch of you guys. We love what's happening. There's a new parking lot going in at Buchanan. I think we have some pictures of that. That's going to be a difference maker uh, out there, so we're excited. You know, we, we put our porch and new portals, all the new entranceways here uh, at our Battlefield campus that have made just a just a big, big difference, so we're excited about that. The town square, I hope tonight before you leave, please do me a favor, before you leave, just make your way out uh, the foyer and just take a look around at the town square. It is so close to being open. Our first event uh, for our town square is scheduled this Sunday for a connection event, but it is going to be super cool space, flexible space that we're going to be using in just a ton of ways, and so we're excited about that. Also, another thing to celebrate, just uh, just opened this week is, is our new Biblical Counseling Center here. And so one of the things, uh, we've been doing Biblical Counseling, the Scott Reader, where's Scott? Scott's in the room tonight. Scott and his team doing a, there's Scott back there in the back. And, and there's many of you guys are Biblical Counselors, Encouragers, involved in this care ministry. One of the things that we've been doing because we've been trying to live practically is all of the counseling sessions that we have here, they're just spread out all over the church, and people are just wherever there can be a, a spare office. And, and so that was a good use of our space. But you understand when you're coming for counseling, and uh, I've done that, you, you kind of just don't want to walk around 100 people. You just want to kind of get to your room and meet with your counselor. So we're going to have just now just this set biblical counseling space down in the 500 wing. So if you're down that way tonight, you can take a look at that. And Scott and his team will, will be down there. One of the fears that I had during COVID was we had made some obligations to some strategic partners, folks who were planning churches, folks who were serving uh, in really strategic places. And so just how are we going to be able to honor those commitments that we had made to them? So tonight, just a, just a couple of things. You know, every weekend when we're worshiping uh, here, uh, Pastor Jorge Alejandro and Christian La Represa are gathered every single week serving the Lord there, and that ministry just continues to flourish, so we're thankful for that. In, in Boston, Brian and Katie and the team that are there, I think we have a picture of a baptism from our uh, partner in Boston, Brian and his team, Grace City Church, which we're just excited uh, about that. 
Uh, we also have, uh, some of you have had a chance to meet Jose and Ada. They are on the Yucatan Peninsula, just an amazing couple in a little village called Chinche. And they are working with people that have just not been exposed to the gospel. And just the, the stories that we're hearing there of what's happening on the Yucatan Peninsula are super, super exciting. And so it's just a lot to celebrate. Tonight in Salt Lake City, we have a mission team that's out there with uh, Pastor Ben uh, who is the pastor there, Ben Hiley, who was, was here. You heard him uh, speak uh, over the summer. And so the church there in Salt Lake City that we're partnering with, I, I was going to hold this picture because there's a lot of work to be done in Salt Lake City. See the little guy in the back with the, the mixed camo? Somebody needs to get to him. You don't do that. If you're going to be a redneck, you got to do it right. you got to match your camo up. That's, a, that's seriously a – it's really – where's Bubba Warren? I saw you. You, you need to go on a trip straight. Yeah, you got to tell him, you know. You don't do redneck like that. That's bad. So anyways, but they don't know any better. They're just learning. So anyways, what, what I was saying, the Salt Lake City Church is exciting. And we've got a team right now that's in Salt Lake City. I don't know if you heard me say that they're serving there. Uh, Pastor Ben Curtis is on that trip. He's there in Salt Lake City. So just super exciting stuff happening there. Endure, our partnership with Endure, which is so cool, what's happening with children in our city. And in fact, after our Christmas, after our Christmas Eve offering, of, of being able to bless Endure Athletics, uh, they hired one of our own. True, where is True? True's here tonight. I saw, I'm, look, I'm calling people out tonight. Where are you, True? On the other side? Yeah, True's working with Endure. I was saying about this today, so they were able to hire you with the gift that we made, and, and you know, you're working with them, but you go to church here, so we're still going to get your tithes, so we're going to get a little kickback out of the deal. So that's good. Keep it in the house. And then Chris Johnson is Man Maker Ministry uh, in, our, in our city. So really excited about those strategic partners and, and so many others. So we've been able to meet uh, those obligations. Not obligations, but commitments, I should say. Commitments we made with those strategic partners. So I love that. J just real quick, uh, over, over the summer, some exciting stuff with uh, Vacation Bible School and Rock the Block. Think about this. Because we're coming back after COVID, and so people are cautious over this is kind of a conservative number, over 1,300 children we were able to expose to the gospel through VBS and Rock the Block this summer, which is really, really exciting. So you think about that, that's more kids than we had in Bible school pre-COVID when you put those two things together. So I just love how our church pivoted, and so many of you, over 50 of you uh, did Rock the Blocks in, in your home and so we, we think between seven and 800 children were exposed to the gospel through Rock the Block. So we're really excited about that. Student camp, I think we have some pictures of student camp. Student camp was a blast. Amy and I had a great time uh, up there. Nick was up there. Just Todd and his team just did an amazing job. And I think my, I think my, my math is right. I think 18 baptisms out of that week at student camp. 16 already taken place, and two more are scheduled. And then seeing several young people and even adults over there as counselors surrendered to full-time Christian service while they were there at camp. So I'm telling you what, it was a moment. God, God moved in a powerful way. It was a great, great time. We had our first ever, I, I love th this picture, I love this picture that I'll show you. We had our first ever special needs camp this summer. Matt and his team, an overnight camp for our special needs ministry. And so it's just exciting what's happening, the impact that's making, not only in these kids' life, uh, but in their, in their family's life. And Chris is, true love, Chris is here. And, and you know the impact on the, these families that they have. But to be able to have a camp and their kids go and spend the night is a big deal for these families. So we're just so, so excited uh, about that. Uh, as well. Our college lead team, and I, I, there's just tons of things. Our college lead team, Dakota and his team, we had students that came through this lead program this summer and interned with us. Some of these, some of you guys are here tonight, aren't you? Some that were in the lead team. Yeah, I see a few of you guys. That was really a cool, really a cool event. Now, here's what we're focusing on for the fall. I'll just share a few things uh, that, that we're excited about. I want to just kind of, while I have this time uh, tonight, just to kind of sort of cast this vision. We want to continue to improve our online a presence and what we're trying to do digitally because it is a it's a totally different day so we're trying to improve that here's a picture of a guy named brian elliott from delaware this is kind of an interesting story that over covid three different individuals flew uh to murfreesboro to be baptized here at new vision because they came to faith in christ online and so it's really really cool i i just i love that so we want to continue to in, in, in improve that. And some of you are serving as Chad hosts, and there's just a whole new different way to serve 
uh, online, so we're excited about that. In our young adult ministry, Danny and Taylor, you guys are sitting back there in the back. Danny, Danny has done just a great job in our student ministry. He's still going to be involved in our student ministry. But uh, Danny has taken on our young adult uh, ministry, and it's just really cool to see what's happening uh, there and, and see these uh, young folks after college really connecting and growing. So we're excited about that ministry. We want to just continue to see that grow. We're going to give it some uh, more focus and effort this fall. Uh, new Christian discipleship. You know, there have been a, there have been a, we've been blessed to see a lot of people come to faith in Christ and a lot of people baptized here, which is super exciting. Uh, we have felt like we just need to do, as, as, as a lot of churches do, we need to do a better job of just making sure people don't fall through the cracks. And so Nick has taken on a new role. He's still going to be doing what he's doing, uh, teaching and basically telling everybody here what to do. He'll still be doing that, right? That's still going gonna, still gonna to happen, right? You're still, still, that's right, good. And, and, but he's going to take over uh, just this uh, discipleship from the time someone comes to faith in Christ until they get grounded and connected in a group. And so we're really excited about that ministry. I think it's going to be a great thing uh, for us to focus on uh, this fall and, and carrying on. He's got some uh, really cool ideas for that, so we're excited. Our new member experience, we've tried to beef up our new member uh, experience. We're going to a three-week class. Joseph and Brad have done a good job putting that on. We started our first one last Sunday night, had some really neat folks there, and so it'll last three weeks. Try to spend more time developing relationships, help people kind of get integrated into the church. And then our 50-plus ministry, I know there's a lot. Our 50-plus ministry, we're going to give it more time, effort, and energy. We're in the search for someone to take that role as our 50-plus uh, pastor, so we're, we're excited about that. We haven't really put the probably the effort and energy in the past that we really need to do there, but we really believe the time is right to do that. Another thing that we're going to be doing that you're going to be hearing a lot about, we're going to elevate serving teams because if you've been around here uh, for very long, we push groups over and over again. We're going to continue to push groups. But one of the things that we're going to say slightly different, you're going to hear it a lot this fall, slightly different, is we're going to elevate serving teams. So folks, uh, maybe your ministry, just like some of you, some of you are serving uh, but aren't in, in a group. And there's just a limited amount of time that everybody has, and we understand that. So we're just saying those are just kind of co-equal opportunities. But as you're serving, we're going to try to make sure that each team that you're serving on really has biblical community that you're taken care of. And so we're going to have more people maybe jump in and serve and, and find community through serving. Uh, right now, about... Uh, we have, you know, we, we say we have about 40% of our people here uh, and at Buchanan that uh, worship with us that are involved in a small group. And then about 15% are not in a group but serve. So that makes me feel just a little bit better. About 55% of our people that are here on any given weekend are, are connected in some way. So we're excited. We want to grow that. Also, and this is going to segue into my uh, talk here. You're, 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 some of you are thinking you haven't even started your talk. I haven't. But it's going to go fast, right? I promise. We're going to talk about conflict. You're going to love it. We want to work on this fall improving our leadership training experiences. Like, I, I want to tell you how I feel right now. Listen, there are about 400 people in this room. You have given us two hours of your time, two hours that you really don't have, right? Because everyone is busy, and so we want to make sure that every single time, to the best of our ability, when we gather together to try to train, we want to equip you. I would love, here would be the goal tonight, we want to we equip you that when you leave a meeting this next year, any kind of training meeting that you feel like you picked up some tools that can help you grow as a leader, not just in what you do at the church, but it's going to help you uh, tomorrow in your workplace, on campus, in your marriage. It's going to help grow you as a leader in every facet of your life. And so we want to spend some time. We're working really hard on uh, spending some time to really improve our leadership training. And so that's going to let me just segue right in. Then Brian's going to come up in just a, just a couple minutes, segue into our, our talk tonight for just a couple minutes on leadership uh, for, for my perspective. We're going to talk about handling conflict. Because if you're going to breathe on planet Earth, you're going to have conflict. And so conflict is going to really, in so many ways, it's going, how we handle conflict is going to define us in so many ways. Maybe one of the best things that I heard on, on, on leadership as it relates to how to hon handle conflict really is this. It says, how you or I handle conflict really reveals who has a handle on us. Right? And so I want to talk a little bit about some keys to handling conflict. Some of this, you, you know... You, 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 you've heard, and, and some of it may be new, but I hope tonight, after this next 10 or 15 minutes, that you, you feel like, you know what, in some small way, I think I feel a little bit better handling conflict inside my marriage, 
uh, inside my my workplace, uh, with a roommate, you're a college student, or inside ministry as you're working side by side with people. So here's the first thing about conflict. Conflict's given. Conflict is just a given. Conflict just is. And I, I want to I show you a passage in Acts chapter 15 with the Apostle Paul. Maybe, right, maybe one of, one of, certainly one of the top five greatest Christians who ever lived would be the Apostle Paul. Would you agree with that? But the Apostle Paul experienced conflict. So here's one of those in, in, in Acts chapter 15, verse 36. Sometime later, Paul said to Barnabas, let us go back and visit the believers in all the towns where we preach the word of the Lord and see how they are doing. So Paul and Barnabas, if, you, if you, you, some of you know the story, Paul and Barnabas were very close friends. Barnabas, his name meant son of encouragement. Barnabas was just a good dude, right? And so it was Barnabas, when Paul came to faith in Christ, the Christians in Jerusalem, were freaked out by him. And so it was Barnabas that helped bridge the gap and develop a relationship for Paul to kind of come in and, and be exposed to the first believers. It was Paul and Barnabas who went on the first missionary journey. That's what this passage is talking about. Paul says, let's go back and revisit those churches that we started. So these were guys who had close, close relationship. Uh, it says in, in verse 37, Barnabas wanted to take John, also called Mark, with them. But Paul did not think it was wise to take him because he had deserted them in Pamphylia and had not continued with them in, in, in the work. So John Mark on the first missionary journey, he just takes his toys and goes home. Something happens and he, he, he leaves. Look at verse 39. They, meaning Paul and Barnabas, close friends, godly, godly dudes, had a sharp disagreement. What is that? That's conflict. That so sharp of a disagreement that they parted company. Barnabas took Mark and sailed for Cyprus, and Paul chose Silas, and, and he left, commended by the believers to the grace of the Lord. Now, why do I share that passage with you? If the Apostle Paul and Barnabas had conflict, it, it just reminds us that conflict is going to be a part of our, our life. In Galatians chapter 2, Paul has another conflict with, with Simon Peter, and, and, and he goes toe-to-toe -to -toe with Simon Peter. So conflict is, is just going to be a given, and you have to understand that. That doesn't make you, if you have some conflict in your life, that doesn't, doesn't make you a bad person. It just makes you a human being. Now, so in, in any phase of our life, if we're going to grow and get better, continual improvement is going to take conflict. Inside your marriage, we say this a lot to couples inside of marriage, on the other side of conflict is greater, and I was so hoping somebody would repeat that as a pastor. Nobody tells me I got more. On the other side of conflict is greater intimacy, right? So if inside your marriage, if you're going to be, if, 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 you're, if you're married, you're going to experience conflict. Ladies, Amen. Right? Everybody knows that, right? Guys, guys won't say that, but yeah, it's just a part of it. And that doesn't make you weird or wrong. Right? Paul and Barnabas had conflict. Paul and Simon Peter had conflict. So it, there, there is, there's, if you're going to grow or improve in anything, it's going to take some, some conflict. Here's the second thing. If you want to try to help manage conflict and, and, and grow as a leader, and I want to grow as a leader, and I want to grow as a leader. I have not handled conflict well in a lot of different facets of my life. The second thing tonight is we have to over-communicate the expectations. Because in our mind, in, any, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a relationship that we have, in a, in a work relationship, I mean in a... In a serving in a ministry, any kind of relationship, we kind of have a set of expectations in our mind and another person has another set of expectations and most of the time they don't line up. And so if you're going to grow and if I'm going to grow as a leader, we have to over-communicate the expectations. If you're a leader, everybody who serves with you in whatever facet, they need to know how you keep score, right? Right? They need to know very clearly how you keep score. I think it's an important thing. And over-communicate that. And understand, even in marriage, I, I say this and people disagree with me. Uh, sometimes in marriages, we think the other person just ought to innately know what our expectations are, kind of, you know, what, what we want. And, and so as, as Amy and I have even grown in our marriage, one of the things that is so cool is she'll say, you know what, I wish you knew this. But, but you don't, so I, I'm, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna tell you what I need in this situation, right? And that you know what that's just very helpful, and that's just clearly communicating these expectations, and it helps in, in, in to avoid conflict. Now here here's the third thing I would say, is I think if we're going to navigate conflict well, we have to be willing to lead with weakness, right? I have to as a leader. I say this 
a lot. I have to, as, as a leader, just expose a weakness in my life. It creates a culture where it kind of lowers the temperature a little bit, and people can kind of listen and, and, and open up. I, I was saying this this week with the in a, in a difficult situation here in, in, in our staff. I mean, we, we have conflict here. It's part of it. And so I was... Uh, I was saying, here's something that I struggle with. I have struggled through COVID speaking to a camera. Like when we were doing church services just all online. And so I, I'm, I don't get nervous about this. I, I enjoy this and I can see you and I'm, I'm, I'm interacting with you now. It is so hard for me just to talk to a camera with no one in the room. We had services where, where we were here and, and the only person in the room was just running the camera. It was just, just me. It was weird. And I said, here's what I do. When I'm just talking to a camera, I sound like a used car salesman. Like, thank you so much for being here today. You know, it's just like weird. It doesn't seem to sound like me. I just, it's like, you know, push, pull, or drag. It's just weird. It's not me. And something happens when the light comes on on that camera, I just turn into a different person. I was like, it's just so strange. And, and somebody said, I know, it is weird. I've watched that. <laughs> I was like, okay, now we're yeah, all right, yeah. And so just saying, you know what, I don't have it figured out. I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm struggling. Everybody has a limp. Do you agree with that? I mean, everybody in this room has a limp. You've got a limp, and so do, so do I. It's just We're just kind of awkwardly navigating life. And so when you lead with weakness and open that up, it just kind of helps people handle conflict a whole, lot, a whole lot better. Opening yourself up to correction as a leader. Um, Josh is going to love this. I'm just, it's just freestyle here tonight. I was having lunch with our children's ministry team today, and I said, I, here's what I said to them. I said, you know, we just, we just came off the hills of family worship month, and tell me how we can do better with that. Like, uh, what, what, what would you like to see us do better? And Josh said, uh, you're preaching. <laughs> Where is Josh? He's probably leaving. No, it's a great feedback. He said, it was the same as it always is. It wasn't kid friendly. It was just the same as you always do. I said, all right. Yeah, I can hear that. So, so basically what he said is if you, want, if you want to be better, like, and I just opened it up. Like I told him, like, if you don't want to hear, you better not ask. I said, how can we get better? And he told me, I love that. I absolutely love that because that's the only way that we can be, get better, right? I need to hear that. So I'm already thinking about next July, right? I, I, I want to I I communicate to our children better. I got to think about that. Now, I would not have really known that if he hadn't have pushed into that. Now, Josh is probably not going to be working here next week. But anyways, it's good. And I, I really appreciate what, what he had to say. Now, here, here's, the, here's, the, here's the fourth thing I would say. And, and, and when, when there's a tough conversation, and you're going to have to have tough conversations with people in, in your life, right? Isn't that? That's just part of it. That's just part of, of, of that. I, I would say this. In tough conversations, always use more than words. And I, I think Brian's going to get into this way better in, in the next session, but sometimes when it's, a, an appro when it's appropriate just to put a hand on a shoulder or make sure your nonverbals are demonstrating love and safety and encouragement. Man, I think about this this week. I, I had to have a tough conversation with someone this week. It was a tough, hard conversation that nobody wanted to hear, but I was just thinking throughout that I want to, in everything I'm exu exuding nonverbally, I want to communicate love and I'm with you and safety, all those things, because I think that is so important. So in conflict, be so mindful of your, of your, of your nonverbals. A pat on the shoulder, putting your arm around somebody's neck, and having that conversation is so meaningful, man. I, I just, I, I grew up as a, I grew up as an athlete, so athletes are used to to conflict, always having people criticize them. You know what? My my coach in college, when he would come, he had, I can still see him now. He's gone to be with the Lord. A big chaw of tobacco in his mouth, and just nasty. But anyways, he, he'd always come up and he'd put his arm around you. Now, when he put his arm around you, it was not going to be good. Right, but it was so cool how he do it. I can still see him with a big chaw in his mouth. He put his arm around you. He said, he, he, he said, he called me Coop. He said, Hey, Coop, you're not playing today. I was like, okay, right. But it felt good because you know because he, he had his arm around me. His nonverbals were communicating what? I care about you. I love you. You know, you're still my guy. You can't hit, but you're my guy. <laughs> so that, that's good. Now here's the last thing, and then I'm done. Brian, where's where's Brian? You're there you are, back there, buddy. Stay out of my office. Be coachable. When, when, let me set this up. Give me a few seconds. When people talk about conflict, it's always centered on, on how we 
right? You go and handle a difficult situation with somebody who's wronged you or is not meeting expectations or, or how you go and deal with another person, right? But I think the part that we don't talk about as it relates to conflict is how you receive it, right? Because right now in your life, somebody wants to have a hard conversation with you because you got a limp and so do I, right? I was so thankful for Josh sharing that with me today, right? I mean, he said, I, it was a hard conversation. Can you imagine telling your boss your preaching really stunk? <laughs> it was a lousy. It was, it was not great. I want to be honest with you, right? So somebody wants to have a hard conversation with you because there's some frustration in the relationship. So how are you going to handle How are you going to handle that? Can I say this? Be coachable. Great leaders are coachable. Great leaders are coachable. I always ask this. Pastor Greg knows this. I always ask this. When we're thinking about uh, hiring, a hiring decision, or or maybe elevating someone, that's one of the questions that I ask outside of are they spirit-led and growing? Are they coachable, right? Because if somebody's coachable, man, they can play, right? But be coachable. When somebody comes in and you know it's one of those tough conversations, make it easier on them. You know, you know what's happening. I never will forget. Uh, Amy and I are celebrating our 29th anniversary this weekend. I remember, yeah, thank, thank her. Yeah. Can you imagine? Um, I, I can still see the room that I went into that when I asked her dad if, to, uh, if I could marry her. I was 21 years old, complete moron. <laughs> right? You think it's bad now. And I'm going to take his baby girl. And he, is, he, was the, he was an impressive guy, godly guy, successful guy. I mean, he was a guy, he didn't just have, I mean, he didn't just have one office, he had two offices. He had an office off an office, and so I went to his office off the office. And I met with him, and I, I was so nervous, and I sat down, and he preempted me, and he, he knew exactly why I was there, and he made that conversation so easy. And I never will forget that. And, and when, when you know that's one of those 5% conversations, make it easier on them. Because here's the thing. People always say this. Boy, I don't like conflict. I don't know anybody who likes conflict. Do you? I mean, if you do, I am scared to death of you, right? You know, no, me, I love it. I eat it for breakfast. What's my point? It's hard on them. If they're having a hard conversation, they don't want to be there and they don't want to do it, right? Would you agree? Do you? No. So when you know that, make it easier. See, because successful people are coachable. you got a limp, right? I mean, to, to not be coachable means that, that you've got every facet of your life dialed in, and you don't, and neither do I. I mean, the Bible clearly tells us is that, right? And so here's what I would say. For, for this next season, make a commitment to hear tough conversations better. Make a commitment in your own life. You know what? Inside a marriage or with a, with a roommate, a, a teacher, a, a boss, a parent, whatever, make a commitment to hear tough conversations better. Now, how could I do that? Let me, let me try to explain this just really quickly. There is always a conflict gap because here's what I believe. You may disagree with it, but think about it. When someone's having a hard conversation with you, it's worse than they're leading on probably because they're soft-selling a little bit. Why? Because they hate conflict. It's probably worse than what they're leading on, leading with. Does that make sense? I mean, think, think about it from your perspective. When you've had to have tough conversations with somebody, it's really worse than the way you've communicated it. Is that true? Some of you are nodding. Some of you are like, oh, gosh, that is true. But here's the thing. We think it's way better. We hear it as way better. So do you see how huge the gap is? It, it's really worse than you realize, and you, you think it's a whole lot better, so there's a huge gap. So you've got to realize that this is really hard, and there's probably more that they want to say, so I need to hear that. And so if, if, you, if you want to really make a commitment to handle conflict, be coachable better, handle, handle tough conversations better, right, realize there's a big gap in that. Start to shrink that. Secondly, don't be defensive. If you don't get anything else tonight, defensive people, defensive people, cannot have healthy relationships with anybody, right? And, 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 and def being defensive comes out of insecurity, right? So don't be defensive. Always ask a follow-up question maybe. Instead of trying to bash that person for what they're saying or how they said it or didn't say it perfectly, right, you know, ask a follow-up question. Hey, thank you so much for sharing that. I did not know that. Could you tell me another thing that, that, that I could know that I could improve in this area? 
First of all, it'll freak them out, right? But it, when somebody is having the courage to do that with, with us, it's gold, right? I mean, I'm, I'm picking on Josh today because just an example that happened five hours ago at my favorite Mexican restaurant, which I'm not going to go back for a week because I'm wounded, right? And so I said, man, that's right. He, he says, I, I, what he said was right. My messages during our, our family ministry month were exactly like they are any other time. Some of you are nodding. I wish you wouldn't do that. <laughs> You're right. That's exactly right. It's right. So a question is, how could I do that better? You know what their suggestion was? Get some other people to come and speak. Okay. <laughs> okay. Wow. That's tough truth, right? And that just tells me, you know what I'm saying? No, I'm going to do better. I'm going to do better, right? And, and, and then when you have a tough conversation, last thing, don't quit for 48 hours, right? If your boss has a tough conversation with you tomorrow, don't quit. Give it 48 hours. Something will happen in 48 hours. You'll settle down. You'll get some perspective. Don't lash out, right? When you have a tough conversation with your spouse, don't lash out. Take a walk around the block. Pray, you know. Wait, let things settle down a little bit, and that's be a better way that you can handle handle conflict. So I hope, and that, that was long, I hope that that just helped you just a little bit as we think about growing as a leader and how to handle conflict uh, just a little bit better. And if there was one principle that we could pick up from there that will help us just a little bit, I mean, you got pasta too, so that was on top of that. So, I mean, it, it's a win tonight. So I hope it helps you. I have the honor now of introducing to you Brian Rose. Brian, Brian Rose is a senior lead navigator at Exano. Exano is a church consulting company. He's also over there, all of their communications and their marketing. Brian Rose is a member here at New Vision. His wife, Kelly, uh, works in our college ministry and just does an amazing job. Uh, Brian has served some great churches in the past. Brian is a dynamic leader, and Brian is a strategic leader here in this place, and he has helped our staff so, so much, and I'm so excited about you having a chance to hear from Brian tonight because you're going to enjoy it, and you're going to learn some, fr some from it. So would you do me a favor? Would you make Brian feel welcome tonight as he comes and shares? Thanks, Betty. Appreciate it. Yep. Well, it's great to be able to serve my church family in this way. Uh, I love the fact that God has planted us here, and uh, we are a part of this fellowship and serving alongside you guys. So I'm going to talk about active listening tonight. We're going to do a little bit of active listening training. But the first thing we need to do is really kind of practice listening, all right? We're going to do a little bit of an exercise. Uh, I checked in. I, I, for the most part, everybody here has been background checked so this exercise is going to be okay. I want you to find someone at your table. You don't have to get up. Just sit right there where you are. Not somebody you live with, right? So somebody you may have met tonight, somebody you're familiar with, um, but somebody else that's not a member of your household. And, and in the next 90 seconds, I want one of you to tell the other one. So you're going to get in pairs. I want one of you to tell the other one how to get from here to your house. Again, everybody's been background checked, so we don't have to worry about this. We're, we're going to be okay. Like, we're not stalkers here. At, I see a couple stalkers back there, but maybe, maybe for the most part, they're on the student ministry team, so we're good. Um, hey, listen, here's what we're going to do. Uh, you're going to take someone. If you have trouble figuring out who's going to be the one that gives directions, whoever's birthday is closest to today. Whoever's next birthday is closest to today is the one who gives the direction. So turn around to someone you don't live with, someone you don't know. 90 seconds, give directions to your house. Go.
15 seconds, 15 seconds. If you're not done yet, you're not going to be. 15 seconds. Into the stage there. All right. All right, stop. Stop. Honest answers only. Honest answers only. All right. If you're the listener, I'm talking to you, not the one that was talking. I'm talking to the listener. Uh, Honest answers only. Uh, Raise your hand if you already knew that person, already knew where they lived. This was kind of redundant. Anybody there? Okay, okay. Uh, Raise your hand if honestly, based upon that conversation, you could get to their house right now. You needed to. Pretty good. Pretty good. Pretty good. Raise your hand uh, if you, there's no way you could get to their house because you're sitting there wondering, why in the world are we doing this? Honest answers. How many of you, why in the world are we doing this, right? Some of you are like, good grief. What is this dude? That Brady's never going to let that guy talk again, I hope. Uh, some of you may, how many of you uh, could not get there because you were honestly thinking about something else? You were thinking about how you would tell them to get to your house, right? How many of you, honest answer, how many of you were doing that? How many of you uh, could get part of the way there because you were able to picture some of those places they were talking about? Some of those turns, some of those things, right? Um, how many of you just, there's no way you could get there because honestly, we had pasta for dinner and bread and, you know, you're kind of like, it's been a long day and you're thinking about like what time is this going to be over and, you know, is, you know, the new season of whatever show. So I think here's the, the thing. We're going to talk about active listening. The hope is for you to have some, some skills that are not just for volunteer teams, as Brady said, but really in life, you know, it, but we need to talk about listening first. And I think the first reality is this. The first reality is that listening is hard. Listening is hard. Did you know that um, only about 20, per, uh, only 78 percent of your waking hours is, is spent listening. Uh, they're about 20% is nonverbal, non-communication. You know, you're not really in, in any communication at all. And then, then about, about 40% of that 80% left, so about half of your life, uh, if we kind of color it in with the blue here, is spent listening. You know, you spend about half of your life in this mode where you're listening. Now, the other part of this is, is a little bit of speaking. So some of you uh, have jobs, maybe have um, habits or hobbies where speaking is a part of that. So the red in here, uh, smudgy a little bit, is, is speaking. Uh, some of you uh, read a lot. And so percentage-wise, uh, your life, there's a, there's a little bit of reading there. Uh, and even there's, there's a few of us in here that do some writing so we'll put this little bit of yellow down here. But for the most part, when you look at these colors, uh, by the way, um, graphs are boring, so I thought I'd just color. Uh, um, Paige let me borrow some stuff. Uh, and so, so really, the, a, a large portion of your life is spent listening. And, and the rest of that time, you know, we're, we're doing, we spend maybe a one and a half times more listening than speaking. Verbal information goes, I didn't know this, verbal information goes in right into your short-term memory. In order to be converted to long-term memory, it actually takes visual. The visual information goes straight to a different part of your brain, the occipital lobe, Greg, Greg occipital lobe, uh, and that immediately gets stored into hard long-term memory. So in order to remember something you've heard, as a listener, you have to sometimes commit that or convert that to visual image. And so we spend a lot of our time, this blue area is spent listening, much more than speaking, much more than some of those other things. And so, you know, one of the, one of the thoughts is, is that, you know, that's why Jesus used illustrations. Jesus talked about a fig tree and showed him the fig tree and the fields being white to harvest and, you know, living water versus well water when he's standing at the well. Why? Because, listen, we, we remember we're wired that way. God designed us that way. So the first idea here is that we spend a lot of our life listening. So it's important to be thinking about that. The next thought is, and the reality here is that listening is hard. Listening is hard. If you think about it, the ability, your brain processes information at a rate of about 125 to 175 words per minute. When you're speaking, you speak at about 125 and 175 words per minute. So the average speaker says, hey, listen, I, I speak there at 1040 on Sunday morning. Brady clocks twice that, right? When it's 1040, we got to get everybody out because there's 11 o'clock service. Brady, Brady doubles that speed, right? 
Here's the great news for Brady. Your brain can process up to 400 to 450 words per minute. Your brain can process almost four times the speed that your mouth can when you're speaking. So the reality is, is that there is a big gap in there. There's a big space in here. And listening is hard because we have to fill this space. Someone speaking to us is speaking to us at about a quarter of the rate that we can understand that verbal communication, which means sometimes listening is hard because we're, our mind is somewhere else. It's almost like owning a, a Ferrari in Murfreesboro. Like, how good is a Ferrari going to be in Murfreesboro? And you say, well, but I, can, I commute to Nashville. Have fun, right? <laughs> Great job every day, every morning, every evening. Drive that Ferrari home on 24 and enjoy your life, Right? Like, that's about how our brain feels when we're listening to someone talk, especially if they talk slow. Last week, we're on vacation at the beach. I was still in this mode of listening, and my family was in this mode of talking. I was just like, come on, come on, finish the sentence, let's go. You know, I could feel myself in that tension of that. So what happens in this space is, is that we, we do other things. We prejudge what that person is wearing. Really, I wouldn't have made that choice. You know, okay, you know, where did he get the orange shirt from? You know, that's the other question we get. Um, we think about, uh, we overfocus on a moment of disagreement. We micro in, we zero in on one fact, like, well, how does he know that? And is that really biblical? And, you know, so sometimes we lose ourselves in the middle of a fact or a moment there. Sometimes we fake attention. In this, in this place in here, we fake attention. I remember uh, my, my 17-year-old daughter's in here, so I think she's old enough to handle the story. When, uh, when my dad used to holler at me, I would look right at the middle of his unibrow. Now listen, I'm not throwing shade because the unibrow is strong in our family, but I can remember I would fake attention. I would, I would look right there in the middle of his unibrow, and he could yell at me all day long, and there was no, I had no clue what he was saying because I wasn't dialed in, but it looked like I was. And so that's the reason listening is hard is because, listen, we, only, we have so much more capacity to listen than speak. And so it kind of creates this tension in here. Uh, here's, here's a third thought. Here's a third thought. Um, and this is where I'm going. The greatest gift you give may be your attention. Maybe your attention. The greatest gift you can give in our world today could possibly be your attention. Have you ever... And if, if you don't believe that we live in an overstimulated, overattentive, uh, overdistracted world, drive down St. Andrews. Anybody live in New Murfreesboro with me, right? Isn't there two Murfreesboros? Right, is, that, is that me or is that, you know? In New Murfreesboro, for those of you who live in Old Murfreesboro, there's a street called St. Andrews. And there's at least always one mailbox laying on the ground on St. Andrews. <laughs> at least. One is in some process of reconstruction. One has brand new mortar. You can see somebody's really proud and steel rods in it, right? No lie. St. Andrews, there's always one mailbox down. And, and it's like how it's a wide street. It's not a very fast street, but somehow, you know, people don't pay attention. And I think that as we think about uh, what's going on, the big companies that spend a lot of money to grab our attention, you know, I think about our families, and the reality is, is that, as parents, grandparents, our, our kids need our attention the most, right? What, the, our attention today in a world of crazy distractions and, and fragments, the greatest gift we can give is our attention. I mean, because it, it is um, on some levels somewhat easy to say, hey, listen, I'm going uh, to give you my support, right? And maybe that's friends, family, maybe coworkers. Like, I'm going to give you my support. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to be there in, in, a, in a kind of a, on the phone when you need me. I'll answer texts within a couple hours maybe. Uh, I'll pretend like I didn't see it, you know, check my reads and make sure they're off, um, you know, some of those things. I'm going to give you my support. And then there's kind of another level of this where we say, hey, listen, I'm going to go a step further, and I'm going to give you not just my support, but I'm going to give you my presence. I'm going to be there. I'm going to stand beside you. I'm going to, I'm going to have time in my life. You know, some of you tonight, you know, this is, this is even more than support being here is, is, is really lending your presence and, and kind of being in a moment. But when you really think about it, at the core of that, the greatest gift we can give is our attention. We can put down the phone. We can 
stop thinking about what's going on outside the world for a minute. And we can just be in that moment and say, not only am I going to give you my support and my presence, but I want to give you my attention. Deuteronomy 6, a uh, favorite passage of mine. I'm going to be uh, have the opportunity to do some teaching on it around here this, this fall. I mean, you, th- you see parents, this intentionality of intention of attention in that. Being super intentional with our attention as you walk a long way, as you rise up, as you lay down. Think about the other people in your life that God has placed around you that need your attention. Here's a question. Who's far from God but close to you? Who in your life is far from God in their relationship but they're close to you? What might happen if you gave them a little bit more of your intention, attention? If you spent a little bit more time uh, listening to them and leaning in with them, do they have your attention, those people? Uh, the family God's bless you with, do they have your attention? Coworkers who depend on you, do they have your attention or do they just have your support, maybe your presence on a good day, but do they really have um, your attention there? Your small group members, do they have your attention or do they have an hour or two of your time during the week? Are you leaning in with them? Are you listening? Is there, is there time for that? Um, Kelly and I serve on the guest services team here. Uh, love getting to do that, right? Like, I'm the loud guy at the door. And some of you are finally connecting that dot. Um, you know, we, I teach guest services to churches all across the country. And one of the things I say is nobody visits a church for the first time on accident. Nobody visits a church for the first time because they're bored. Nobody visits the church for the first time, gets their family out of bed, drags themselves across town to, to a pretty busy parking lot and navigates that thing because they've got nothing better to do. They're there for a reason. And typically something's broken, something's changing, or something's missing. Do those people we serve Sunday in, Sunday out, Wednesday nights, Tuesday nights, Thursday nights, do they have our attention or do they have a momentary glass? Do they have a, a glance? A, a, they have our support at times uh, or they have our presence because, hey, we showed up. We even 15 minutes early and got our name tags this week. Man, I'm doing good, right? Or do they have our attention? Those smiles uh, to that parent, nervous parent dropping off a child. You know, those, those people walking down the hall and, and your ability to say, hey, it's my first time. Can I walk with you? I mean, that may be the, the biggest thing in their week and the biggest thing they need. And so for us, listening is hard, but the attention we give in doing so may be uh, the greatest gift we can share. Here's the last thought, and then, and then we're going to go uh, to our breakout groups. And the reality of it is, is that um, because listening and our attention is the greatest gift we can give, active listening may be your greatest gospel witness. Active listening, spending a little bit more time may be your greatest gospel witness. I was, I was reading some troubling stats today, and, and if you look at kind of the landscape of the under 25-year-olds uh, in our culture, about one in four, about a quarter of, of young people under 25 report little to no religious affiliation. So one out of every four Folks under the age of 25 say, you know what, I just, I don't have any need for, don't have any care for, don't have any affiliation with the church. Each generation, that's gotten to be a progressively smaller number. If you look back to, uh, you know, what the, the 65 plus generation, uh, even beyond just kind of the titles we put on it, but just look at that age group, that number would be about one in eight, so it would be about right here that would identify uh, as that none. It was hard to see there, so let me use a different color. That worked better on paper. Um, that's about the 65 and older crowd right there. So we've got a big segment of our population now that says, hey, listen, you know, church is not for me. Um, it's not here. And I wonder if it's sometimes because we'd rather have something to say than, than, than someone to listen to. I wonder if it's because we're really more concerned with the message we have than a posture of active listening and hearing where someone's at. What's their story? Why do they feel the way they do? Uh, we live in a culture that really wants to give us those soundbite messages rather than teach us to sit back and listen and say, hey, what, what is going on in your life? Why do you believe that? Um, when I look at the pattern of the early church, 
you know, I, I'm really impressed because they, they had a strong stance on the important issues that mattered and they made sure everybody saw it. No, that's not what happened in the early church. They loved each other. They were known as the followers of the way because, you know, we see in Acts and we see in Hebrews and we see in Romans this description of a people who loved each other, shared everything, had everything, groups like this. This would have felt normal on a regular basis. They loved each other. And when someone came who was outside their group, in a, in a time and a season where you belong to a group, kind of feels familiar, right? You're either with us or against us. You're Roman, you're Greek, you're Jew, you're, or you're this other group. They welcomed them. The philozenia, they, they loved the stranger, that someone who was out of name. And so, so what we have here is the opportunity that as we're guiding people to lives of gospel transformation, our greatest activity in doing that, the greatest open door, may be active listening, may be sharing the gift of attention. So here's what I want to do. Active listening, what does it look like? Was it like Brady, Brady mentioned this. The first kind of thought about active listening, this is either going to work or not work. So, you know, I feel like the power team, pray for me. Um, you know, the first act of, of, of listening, somebody got that joke. My fingers are so slick right now, is the nonverbal. How, what does your nonverbal look like? Are you leaning in? Are you nodding? Are you um, matching emotion? Are you spending time there. Brady, I love that illustration of, you know, your, your coach putting his hand on your shoulder to tell you, you, you know, you're not going in, bro. Um, you know, this, this thing of like, hey, listen, that nonverbal action matters so much. So if you think about active listening, that big in is really just recognizing that 90% of our communication is nonverbal, and your nonverbals as you're listening matters. Your nonverbals matters. Head nods, eyebrow raise, the biggest nonverbal is just put the phone, put the remote down. Stop and linger a minute. But just think about that in, that nonverbal. When I'm active listening, one of the best things I can do is a nonverbal. The second thing is, is really focus on that person. Focus on what's going on, zero in. In this case, the X is going to mark the spot on this, where we just think about, hey, what is this person saying? What's the emotion they're saying it with? Why are they here? Aside from the nonverbal, we've got the X that marks the spot. Hey, I'm going to be an active listener by zeroing in. What are they saying? What's their posture? What are they not saying? Even building mental images of their words. How do I just focus? Don't, don't look at who else is in the room. Don't What else is going on there? But how do I spend this time actively listening to this person? And as X marks the spot, just kind of zero in on what they're doing. A fourth principle for active listening uh, is the rewind, the rewind. Ask them, pause and just kind of restate what they're saying. Hey, what I hear you saying is this. Is it true that what may be happening is this? And so our counselors know this is a big thing, but if you think about that rewind moment where you just say, hey, listen, let me, let, me, let me make sure I'm hearing you right. What I hear you say is when this happens, you're feeling this or you're seeing this. And so that, that idea that we might take a minute and rewind the conversation. Let me make sure I'm not missing. Let me make sure we don't run this down. Let me, let's not run past this. Rewind for a minute. Tell me that again. Now, some of us, that feels a little vulnerable, right? We're like, ah, they're going to think I'm stupid. You know, no, but they're going to think you're listening. They're going to think you care. They're going to think you're giving them full attendance, attentiveness and support. So that rewind moment is there in the last active listening tool, the last ability to do that. Uh, as you know, is to ask questions. We ask questions and clarify. We ask questions and reflect. Are, you know, are, is this what you're feeling when this happens? Um, why is that the case there? This was a lot easier at home, Rose, um, to do this thing. But, you know, ask open-ended questions. How does that make you feel? Why, do you, why did that happen in that way? What is it about this situation that gives you the, the biggest conflict uh, and the biggest challenge. And so those questions then are, are a way to actively keep yourself engaged. Remember that middle spot between how fast someone can talk and how fast you can listen I have, is, is, is found in those questions there. Um, what do you think they meant? How do you think they do that? So, so the four things, nonverbal, nonverbal, 
zero in, think X marks the spot. How do I hear? What am I focusing on? What am I listening to? Rewind the conversation. Hey, can I listen to this a little bit and then ask questions? What did you, what do you mean here? What's happening there? Here's what we're going to do. We're going to close out this little part of our talk. Uh, I want you to switch people. I want you to switch people. I want you to spend the next 90 seconds, the other person give directions to your home. The other person now give directions to your home. And I want you to practice nonverbal, zeroing in. I want you to practice rewinding. Now, what I heard you say was this and asking a question. All right, 90 seconds, go. Let me, let me wrap it. Yeah, I'll wrap it, and then I'll hand it off to you. You're going to give everybody directions on where to go? All right, I lied. Let's go. I lied. I'm not giving you 90 seconds. But listen, how many of you, real quick, honest answers, let's pray. This works every time. Uh, how many of you, honest answers, still didn't pay really good attention? No, you did. Some of you, I know. I know, right? It's that great food. How many of you found yourself kind of intentionally being a better listener? And you realize there's kind of this moment we're in, we've got to do that. But I hope that, you, you know, you take that skill forward, not just for your training tonight, not just for your teams, families, coworkers, and friends. And remember that as we're leading people to lives of gospel transformation, that may be uh, the best skill we have. Nick's going to give you the next steps there. Nick, bring them out. Thanks, Barry. I heard everything you said. His name's Brian. I was making a listening joke. It didn't land. It's all right. They all don't land. Just keep throwing them out there.